Okay, let's get started on the next set of earthquake notes. This is uh, the beginning of earth, the second set of earthquake notes, flip notes number 30. Flip notes number 30. So have your PowerPoint uh, packet there in front of you. Have something with which to write, and let's get started. In this set of notes, we're going to talk about different types of waves. We're going to talk about how to measure earthquakes. We're going to talk about how to locate earthquakes. And we'll talk about damage. A lot of stuff in here. A lot of good detailed information. Probably good of you to break it up into a couple sections as necessary. Here we go. A reminder about earthquakes. In the previous set of notes, we talked about how earthquakes are waves, and waves is uh, energy. Energy vibrating through a medium or through space. All right, we call those waves for earthquakes seismic waves. As you remember, seismology is the study of earthquakes. A wave, as we said, and to remind you, is an oscillating Oscillating is a fancy way to say wiggling. An oscillating disturbance that carries the energy through a particular medium or through space. Earthquakes obviously don't travel through space, but they travel through solid rock. There's two broad categories of these waves. So when you're asked, what are the categories of waves? Body waves and surface waves. And those are pretty self-explanatory as to where the waves are traveling. Body waves travel through the Earth's interior and there's two specific uh, body waves that have been recognized. That is the P wave and the S wave. Stands for primary and, you guessed it, secondary. And we'll study each of these in detail, and we'll use P and S waves quite a bit over the next several class periods. The second broad category of waves is surface waves, and those are ones that were discovered more recently, um, and they simply travel along the surface of the Earth. These are going to be the ones that cause the most damage because, well, quite simply, we live on the surface, and when surface waves come along, they can disrupt buildings, streets, foundations, and infrastructure. Two specific types of surface waves are the L wave and the R wave. This stands for the Love wave and the Rayleigh wave, named after the two seismologists that first recognized them from seismograms. Okay, so let's talk about the P wave. P wave is the primary wave. The reason it's called the P wave, the primary wave, is because it is the fastest. It travels the fastest out of any seismic wave on Earth. So at any particular seismic station that records an earthquake, it always arrives first. It's the primary. For instance, let me put a little illustration here. Here's the surface of the earth, and suppose an earthquake happens right here. Maybe 300 miles away, there's a seismic station. Waves travel out, and as they get further and further away. The P wave is the one that travels the absolute fastest. So it will be picked up here at the seismic station and recorded first. There's other waves, which we'll get to in a minute, which travel slower and they lag behind. And they do not arrive until after the P wave gets there. So remember that P wave is the primary, but you also need to understand its motion, how it's wiggling. A P wave is a push-pull, or a compression wave. So if the wave's traveling this way, the direction of wiggle 
is back and forth. So it's very similar to a sound wave, a compression wave. So these compression waves, P waves, they push and pull like a slinky. The motion is parallel to the direction of the travel. And the speed at which these travel is about five and a half kilometers per second through the Earth's crust. It's an incredibly high rate of speed. P waves, because of their, um, the nature of their motion, this, this push-pull, compression waves, they are able to travel through solids, liquids, and gases. All in all, very little damage is caused by P waves in and of themselves. Okay? So remember that. There's a lot on this slide. P waves are primary. They're push-pull. They're the absolute fastest at about five and a half kilometers per second, and they can travel through all mediums, solid, liquid, and gas. S wave. This is the secondary. Again, this is also a body wave. It's S because it arrives, it arrives after the P wave at any given seismic station. So analogous to uh, the drawing diagram used on the previous slide, here's the surface of the Earth. An earthquake happens here. Here's your seismic monitoring station, your seismograph. P wave travels out, and as it's traveling, the S wave is lagging behind, going slower, until it finally arrives at the seismic station. And there's a time gap. There's a lag. It's called the lag time, the difference in arrival between the P wave and the S wave is going to be very, very important. We'll talk about that in a minute, but let's get back to the S wave. S wave is for secondary. S wave is for side to side or shear motion. In this diagram here, it shows the wave traveling from left to right and the motion of the particles is perpendicular in this case up and down, but it could be side to side. But it's always perpendicular. You learned about these two different types of waves in physics. You call them longitudinal waves and then transverse waves. S waves is a type of transverse wave because the direction of wiggling is perpendicular, that is across the direction the wave propagates. An important part of S waves is that they can only travel through solid material. There's, so there's a lot of letter association that you can use here. P is for primary, P is for push-pull, P is for compression, S wave is for secondary, S wave is for slower, S wave is for shear motion, and S waves can only travel through solid materials. Because S waves are slower, and because of their motion of being side to side, S waves can cause more damage than P waves as they propagate through populated areas. Okay? Talk about the two types of surface waves. In the context of what these waves do, all we worry about with L waves and R waves, that's the two types of surface waves, is that they move very slow compared to the others, and they cause significant amounts of damage. L wave is indeed a surface wave. L is for love, um, a seismologist, Dr. Love, who first uh, studied them. L waves, the way I remember this, they snake along the surface with a side-to-side -side motion. So L for lateral motion, shaking the ground side to side as the ground moves beneath. So this can 
twist bridges, it can rotate foundations, it can warp and spin around concrete parking lots and garages and buildings and things like that. Imagine a building sitting on top of this area right here. It'd be very, very difficult for it to not sustain significant damage. This diagram down here tries again to show in three dimensions the lateral, that's how I always move it, uh, that's how I always remember it, lateral motion, side to side. Surface waves travel the slowest, and therefore they're going to cause significant damage, and they always arrive after the PNS waves. Another type of surface wave, the second type of surface wave that is very destructive is the R wave. Uh, the Rayleigh wave, named for the first scientist to study them. And again, letter association. As the wave is propagating along this way, the particle motion is rolling along. Again, not particularly good for buildings, parking structures, foundations, streets, things like that. There have been reports of um, witnesses during large earthquakes of literally seeing streets um, um, wobble up and down or wave up and down like a jello surface. Those would be the R waves uh, propagating underneath their feet. So again, R waves roll along. They are, they are also the slowest and they arrive after the PNS waves. So when you compare all of them, body waves versus surface waves, and then specifically P waves, S waves, L waves, R waves, it's important to distinguish and contrast their motion. Remember P waves is a push-pull, S waves is a shearing side-to-side, L waves is a lateral left to right along the surface. R waves is a rolling, um, almost like an ocean wave. Also, their speed. You can contrast and differentiate. P waves is always the fastest. S waves gets their second, about 1.7 times slower than a P wave. And then the surface waves, we don't get into the specifics of how slow they travel, other than that they are slower than the body waves and they always arrive last. And then damage. P waves don't cause much damage at all. S waves cause a little bit more damage and then your surface waves down here cause significant dangerous damage. During class um, I'll show you this animated uh, GIF file which shows how the P wave races ahead doesn't cause much damage to your house. The S wave follows shortly behind causes some damage and then the surface waves travel very very slowly compared to the others and they're the ones that can wreck your house or your building or your downtown high-rise. Okay that was the first section of these notes. Um, if you need to take a break, do so. But we'll dive right into the second part here, which is locating an earthquake. Pinpointing it, using the seismic waves to figure out where it occurs. So here we go. A term you need to know is the epicenter. The epicenter, which we mentioned before, is directly above the focus of an earthquake. Epicenter is on the surface, directly above where the earthquake occurred. Seismologists are incredibly interested in finding and studying the actual source of the quake, so they can try and learn as much as they can, so they can model it, so they can know what type of motion occurred along the fault, if it was a new fault or if it was a previously known fault if it was a tectonic boundary or if it's something new. So finding an epicenter of an earthquake in theory is actually pretty darn easy. The method that is used is triangulation. 
and obviously the key to that is three, triangle. Locating anything in um, two-dimensional space along the surface of the Earth on a map. All you need is three frames of reference, so triangulation. So let's take a look. First step in finding the source of a quake is to find the distance from the seismograph that actually recorded the event back to the epicenter. You basically trace backwards and you use this diagram right here or this um, this graph here. This is what's called the P and S wave curve diagram or the P and S wave graph. Hopefully you remember that there was an equation velocity equals distance over time. Do a little bit of algebra and you can rearrange that to say distance traced back to the earthquake is the velocity times the time. Now I told you a few slides back that we do know how fast seismic waves travel and the seismic station that recorded the earthquake knows exactly when the P wave arrived and it knows exactly when the S wave arrived after that. So if you know when the P wave arrived and you know when the S wave arrived, you know the lag time. You know the difference between when the first wave arrived and when the second wave arrived. That is when the P wave got there and when the S wave got there. We can then use that time difference, that lag time, to figure out exactly how far away the earthquake was. Let me give you a few examples. Follow along in your notes. Maybe have a pencil handy. Maybe have a straight edge or a ruler handy because we're going to use this um, graph right here in hopes that you understand um, how it is that you can locate an earthquake. Okay, when we use this table, this graph at right here, we definitely need to understand what it is that we're looking at. Along the horizontal axis, we have distance. Along the vertical axis, we have time. And that's backwards, or flip-flopped, for most things that you've looked at in both science and in math. But that's okay, because we have plotted the P wave curve and the S wave curve travel time uh, for you. They're both here in blue and they're labeled. <clears throat> if you look at the P wave curve, you'll see that what it's trying to show you is this line here going up at an angle is the rate. And what it says that if the P wave travels a thousand kilometers, how long does it take that P wave to do it? here. Ah, two minutes. This is in minutes. Okay, so a P wave can travel 1,000 kilometers in two minutes. How far can a P wave travel in? Or how long does it take for a P wave to travel 2,000 kilometers? So you find 2,000 kilometers, you go up, it intersects right there, you look over to the left, ah, it takes four minutes, and so on and so forth. The S wave how long did it take the S wave to travel a thousand kilometers? You go up a thousand kilometers and you realize, wow, it took the S wave a little bit more time, four minutes. So what was the difference in time that it took for the S wave to arrive from when the P wave arrived? In this case, if the earthquake was a thousand kilometers away, it was this lag time, four minus two, was two minutes. What if the seismic station happened to be 2,000 kilometers away? Well, the S wave arrived at about 7.5 minutes, 7.75 minutes, that is 7 minutes and 45 seconds. What's the lag time? Remember what lag time is. The difference from when the P wave arrived to when the S wave arrived. The P wave arrived, and then one minute, 
two minutes, three minutes and 45 seconds later. So that was a lag time of about three minutes and 45 seconds. Okay. On the chart here, they already they put another one in for you. And there was a lag time of about five minutes. The P wave arrived. And then the clock started ticking. And then five minutes later, the S wave arrived. What does that mean? Well, if you have a lag time of five minutes, you trace down here and you realize that earthquake is about how far away? Oh, about 3,800 kilometers away. And that really is the power of this tool, <clears throat> the power of this graph. Let me erase a few of these things and give you a couple more um, examples just so you can understand. If I were to ask you how far away was an earthquake, how far away was a seismic station from an earthquake if the lag time between the P wave and the S wave happened to be about four and a half minutes. So if the lag time was about four and a half minutes, how far away was the earthquake? Now you're being the amateur um, seismologists. Well, you start looking at this. And if you have to, just do a little trial and error. What was the lag time for here? Remember, that was about two minutes. Okay, what's the lag time right here? One, two, that's about three minutes. So if it had been a three minute lag time, your earthquake would have been about 1,500 kilometers away. All right, so that means the earthquake was further away. We need to go more that way. What if the lag time was one, two, three? Again, that's three minutes and 45 seconds. We tried that one. Let's do it right here. One minute, two minutes, three minutes. That's about a four minute lag time. What are we looking for? Four minutes, four and a half minutes. Four minutes and 30 seconds. So let's jump to right here. Let's trace it up along this particular one. There's about one minute, two minutes, three minutes, four minutes, and about half of a minute. Four and a half minutes, about right there along this line. So we trace that down and we realize, hey, our earthquake, based upon the data, was about 3,000 kilometers away from that particular seismic station. Okay? We're going to do another one. Suppose that you're at a seismic station that gives a reading of a P wave, and then there's a pause, there's a lag, and then the S wave comes in, and suppose that that lag is about one minute. About one minute. Well, you just did one over here that was four and a half minutes. So if the S wave arrives sooner on the heels of the P wave, does that mean the earthquake was closer? Or does that mean it was further away? What's the difference? Well, remember, this is like the old race of the turtle and the hare. And the rabbit, the hare, keeps racing ahead and ahead and ahead and ahead. And the longer the race goes on, the rabbit gets further and further and further ahead. So if you're short, if you're close to the starting line, that tortoise is not going to be too far behind. And that's the case for this. The tortoise was only one minute behind in this example. So that means the earthquake, you got to go this way. And where's one minute? Well, P wave is here. There's one minute. There's two minutes. We didn't go far enough. Let's do it right here. One minute right there. A lag time of one minute, so you trace that down, that was about 500 kilometers away. We're always interested in the lag time. That lag time corresponds to a particular distance. 
a bigger lag time corresponds to a further away distance. A giant lag time corresponds to an earthquake that was thousands upon thousands, maybe tens of thousands of kilometers away. We'll be, we'll be spending a lot of time on this in class, but I wanted to do several examples here on this slide to help you understand what it is, how it is that you can locate an earthquake's distance from the P wave arrival and the S wave arrival, that is the lag time. But we're not quite finished. Just because you have the distance doesn't mean you've located the earthquake. Lag time does not tell you direction. We don't know direction, unfortunately. All right? So what can we do to find direction? Well, that's where we come back to what I mentioned earlier, triangulation. Okay? Again, suppose that you had an earthquake that had a P wave arrival, and then time went by, and then the S wave arrived, and there was a four-minute lag time. Suppose that four-minute lag time happened, and you're trying to figure out where that earthquake is. Well, by using this graph right here, and using the lag time that you've practiced, four minutes, you can look on here and you can see oh, one, two, three, oh, that's three minutes and 45 seconds. That's not quite right. I need to travel further away. So one, two, three, ah, oh, that's about four minutes right there. That was a four minute lag time. So I traced that down and realized that particular earthquake was about 2,500 kilometers away. But I don't know what direction. So, you need three separate seismic stations. Suppose that seismic station A, located here, near four corners, did that lag time um, procedure that we just described a minute ago, and suppose they calculated the lag time and realized the earthquake was 850 kilometers away. They then draw a circle around their location with a radius of 850 kilometers. But all that tells them is that that earthquake happened, what, somewhere inside the circle or somewhere on the circle? Yeah, that's right. It's somewhere just on this circle. But that's an infinite number of locations along the trace of that circle. So we need a couple more. Seismic Station B is doing the same thing. Suppose that they monitor their P wave arrival and their S wave arrival, and they calculate that the quake had a much shorter lag time and they found it was only 400 kilometers away. So here's Seismic Station B down in Baja, California, and they find that the earthquake was only 400 kilometers away. And they draw a circle with a radius of 400 around them. And now we know that the earthquake was what? Inside this area here? No, 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 no. It's not where the circles overlap it's only where they intersect. So we've now got it down to two locations. But that's not uh, enough information. We need a third seismic station, seismic station C, and it does the same thing. P and S wave, the lag time, and suppose hypothetically they calculate it to be 550 kilometers away. They draw a circle around themselves with a radius of 550, and then it's where those three circles intersect, boom, you found your earthquake epicenter. And in this case, it was near Los Angeles. All right, bingo, you found it. Triangulation. We'll be doing some things similar to that. Definitely be doing P and S wave arrival and lag time. One of the more difficult things that we do this unit, if you have questions um, about it, please come in for tutorials or rewatch the slides here on the flip notes. Triangulation is used um, for all seismic activity that occurs around the globe. Quite frequently uh, this triangulation is done via computer because there is a worldwide network of seismographs. So whenever an earthquake occurs, computers pretty rapidly find the epicenter and determine the location.